I've done it. All right, everybody, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Um, if you've ever been to one of our events in the past, uh, you know that we can get into some kind of esoteric political topics. Uh, but tonight we're going super mainstream. We're just going to talk about the election. Okay, I'm joking. It's not entirely true. Uh, but this is going to be a conversation about democracy um, and revolutionary possibility in the context of this presidential race. Uh, and we know there's a lot of interest in the topic because we had over 150 people sign up for this event, which is kind of a lot for our little bookstore. Uh, if you don't already know us, Firestorm is uh, a 16-year-old radical bookstore operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities, particularly in the South. Uh, we're also continuing to book virtual events, both because we love reaching people at a distance and because we know virtual events uh, expand the accessibility of our programming. We got a bunch of exciting events lined up over the next month. Uh, those cover topics from, uh, from tarot uh, to mass incarceration and Appalachia. So if you're interested in eclectic conversations, um, definitely keep up with us. Uh, you can see future events that we post on our social media account. Um, and I'll drop a, a link to our newsletter in the chat as well, if you would like to get that. So tonight we are using uh, Zoom um, webinar, which has a Q&A tool. Uh, feel free at any point throughout the event, uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, to use that Q&A to submit questions that you'd be interested in having addressed. We probably won't get to every question, but we're going to do our best to get into as many interesting topics as possible tonight. Um, and there is a lot. Uh, if you're not on Zoom, maybe you're joining on YouTube, welcome. Uh, this is the first time we've streamed to YouTube. There's not an easy way to ask a question from YouTube, but we really appreciate that you're here. Okay, so we're going to get started, and I'm just going to kick us off with um, some quick bios uh, for uh, our speakers tonight. We've got Andrew Lee, uh, who's supported grassroots social movements for the last 15 years and is the author of Defying Displacement, Urban Recomposition and Social War. If you missed it, we did a really fantastic conversation um, with Andrew uh, and Vicki Osterwell like, uh, when this book first came out. Uh, it's archived on our YouTube page and I really strongly recommend going back and listening to it. Um, Andrew has previously appeared in Yes Magazine, um, the New Inquiry, Teen Vogue, and Roar Magazine. Uh, and he has a new blog, In Struggle, uh, on which he recently published uh, Why to Not Vote, a Free Civic Disengagement Guide. Um, thanks so much for being here, Andrew. Um, we've also got uh, Andrew Zonneveld, uh, who is an independent scholar from Atlanta, Georgia. He's the editor of The Commune, Paris, 1871, and To Remain Silent is Impossible, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman in Russia. And with Nani uh, Ferreira Matthews, he co-edited Why Anarchists Don't Vote, uh, Radical Criticisms of Representative Government. And y'all will have to uh, accept my apology for these very brief bios. Um, I know both of y'all do so much more than what is represented uh, in what I've just shared. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you here. And before we get started, I just want to give um, a little context for tonight's event because we're getting into a topic that we know people have really strong feelings about. Um, when we announced this conversation on social media, um, there was a kind of a big response, uh, which kind of spanned the, the gamut from uh, folks who were really excited that we were making space for a topic that sometimes is treated as a bit of a third rail um, to people who wrongly asserted that uh, any discussion of voter abstention was a move towards nihilism and a call for apathy and inaction. Uh, and of course, because it's 2024, you know, there had to be somebody in there calling the whole thing a PSYOP. Um, so really, really, uh, the, the feelings have been on display here. Uh, but actually, the conversation we're having tonight is one that we know thousands of people uh, around the US are having right now organically. Um, and that's as a result of uh, a growing realization that politics um, here and really everywhere uh, aren't working for most of us. Um, politics aren't working for our planet and politics certainly aren't working for Gaza where the current administration 
has directly facilitated the murder of over 40,000 Palestinians. Uh, the sense that we can't keep doing normal uh, is a signal that we need to reassess where we're at and also kind of uh, evaluate how we got here. And it's an opportunity to explore the nature of democracy and the difference between voting and democracy. So while the anarchist approach to this topic ranges from satirical to scholarly, and I think we'll probably have a bit of all of that tonight, uh, the event is an invitation towards a deeper analysis and commitment to action. Um, so I want to go ahead and pass off to Andrew Lee, who's going to start us and uh, share a little bit, um, kind of starting from uh, the piece that was recently written. Thanks so much for being here, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Um, so I mean, Liberty mentioned this is a topic people have really strong feelings about, and those strong feelings were what I wanted to investigate in the piece that I wrote on my Substack in Struggle entitled Why to Not Vote. Because I get a very strong visceral negative reaction from a lot of people when I say that I voluntarily do not vote. Um, and this would make sense for like patriotic law and order flag waving types to be offended that I don't participate in the American political system, particularly as a person of color who wasn't born in the US. Um, but I don't have that many right wing nationalist ideologues in my close social circles. Um, it's people on the left who um, are my friends and acquaintances and comrades who become indignant um, when I say that, that I choose not to vote. And it seems that there are people who are way more offended by me promoting the idea of not voting than they would be if I were saying, instead of don't vote, like don't follow laws or don't respect politicians once they've been voted into office. Um, even folks with deep critiques of the American state have a strong emotional commitment and ideological loyalty to the ballot box. Folks have an idea that if someone decides to not vote, that's the one thing that they could do to make any of their other political or social ideas invalid. Um, and so I think this is something, you know, regardless of your stance or your ideological orientation. I think that there's something to unpack there because that strong degree of investment in whether someone casts an individual ballot or not, that degree of investment is, in my opinion, not grounded in reality. And I want to be clear about what I mean by that. Am I saying that I think the Republican and Democratic parties are exactly the same? No, I'm not. Am I saying it's immaterial to me whether one politician gets in office and passes uh, one policy or another one gets elected and passes a, a far worse one? No, of course not. Um, like my life was personally negatively affected by specific policies of the, for the example, the Trump administration in ways that many people who criticize my perspective were not. But your individual vote is useless. Useless in, in the most like ordinary, common sense, everyday use of the term. Useless meaning that doing something doesn't change the outcome as opposed to not doing it, right? Um, there's no expectation that the outcome of the presidential election would be different because you individually vote as opposed to you individually staying home, right? Nobody thinks that. It, it's common knowledge that there are only a few swing states within the country that actually end up deciding elections. But, you know, even for folks who live in those swing states, like I do, if, if I were to go to vote with like a strong belief that my individual vote would determine the next president, that would be a delusional belief. Right? There, there's no reason to think that. Nobody thinks that. Um, so that imbalance is what I think is really interesting because I, I think it suggests that there's something going
going on that's much more than sort of like lesser evil pragmatic politics, right? We have a form of civic participation, which is on the individual level, right? Literally meaningless. It's invested with so much emotional and ideological weight. It's something that people feel so deeply about that that's the thing that people want to start flame wars in the Firestorm IG comment section about, right? Um, so like, like, just like think about like the forms of like legal civic participation you can do in like a representative democracy, right? You can vote, you can sign petitions, you can like write letters to your state representative. Like writing a letter to your state representative is almost, has like a infinitely larger chance of actually affecting policy than casting a single individual vote in a presidential race. But nobody says that people who don't write letters to their state representatives are irresponsible, privileged, or right-wing psyops. That's the paradox. So I think the way that we can understand this is like, like what, what does voting actually do? Um, and we're told that it's a way to send information to our rulers, right? who we would like to be in office, what policies we would like them to implement, and in that way, hold them accountable if they don't follow like the democratic will. Um, an individual vote in a two-party system is like a terrible way of sharing information, right? That's why um, politicians have like focus groups and like marketing campaigns um, and, and there's like polling departments and like sociology, right? Um, they get very little information from the votes, it's not particularly great at accountability, especially because um, like we know that there are so many, like so many powerful positions in our society and even you know in the government, like uh, career civil service jobs are not elected. They keep running between administrations. Um, so if voting isn't great at sharing information and it's not great at accountability, what does voting produce, it produces legitimacy, right? It produces legitimacy for the next administration. Um, the, the, the contest of the presidential vote says, who is going to be the next legitimate president? Who will get to be the legitimate commander in chief of a military with foreign bases in a numerical majority of countries around the world? Who will get to be the legitimate head honcho of the Federal Bureau of Prisons and the CIA and the FBI and militarized borders and the bipartisan consensus on the Holocaust in Palestine? Who will be the legitimate person to sit in that role? And I think the principal answered is nobody. Nobody is the legitimate inheritor of that role because that role is monstrous. And whoever fills it is our enemy. And the system that implores us to participate in legitimating that role in any sense is our enemy as well. Um, I don't think you can be a consistent abolitionist, a consistent anarchist, a consistent revolutionary, and participate in a ritual, a political ritual designed to legitimize the systems that are preying on us and the peoples of the world. I think we need to draw a line in the sand. Um, and people have very strong negative reactions because it's like, oh, do you want do you want to give the election to Trump? Do you want to um, do do you not care what policies happen? And again, my individual vote will not decide the presidential election. Um, the like 45 individual votes of the people in this a Zoom call will not decide the presidential election. Um, given that it will not make the thing happen that people are so afraid of, why is there such a visceral, strong, immediate reaction to the idea of someone not participating in the electoral system? Um, I think we have been socialized in by American institutions to fetishize the franchise 
as a way of legitimizing state power, um, the state has always been monstrous. For the people who uphold the sanctity of the electoral system, like, you know, maybe not now with like the election deniers and everything, but like, like when, when was it good? To Reagan terms in the 80s, was it good then? Before the civil rights movement, where there was effectively no franchise um, for millions upon millions of people of color, was it good then? Was it good before women could vote? Was it good when it was only white property owning males? When was it so, so good for democracy? When was it so good for people? And if the franchise is so important, after having it nominally for over two centuries, why are things the way they are? It is not something for us. It is not something we have won. It is a way that the state legitimizes itself. And especially now, as the United States is not supporting, not funding, conducting, planning, engineering, a genocide. If now is not the time that you can skip one presidential election, as may I remind you, half of Amer eligible Americans do anyway, um, there is nothing that will get you to disinvest from the system. And there are no amount of corpses that will dissuade you from participating in, uh, in this ritual. Yeah. Thanks so much, Andrew. I appreciate your your clarity and uh, kind of throwing down the gauntlet there um, for us to consider. Uh, Andrew Zonneveld, I, I failed to call attention to the fact that we've created a situation where we have more than one Andrew tonight. Um, so I want to apologize in advance for any confusion. Uh, but Andrew Zonneveld, if you want to jump in here, um, uh, we'd, I'd love to hear from you before we kind of start, uh, start a discussion with kind of uh, some more back and forth. Thanks, Liberty. I'm a, I'll, I'll try not to take too long. Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to start by by thanking you, Liberty, and, uh, you know, we're old friends. I'm thanking my new friend, Andrew Lee. It's lovely to meet you. Thanking also everyone who registered for this event and most especially everyone at the Fabulous Firestorm Book Co-op uh, for inviting me to participate. Uh, I think... Liberty, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's somewhere around 15 years. Firestorm has been, in my opinion, one of the most powerful and exciting examples of an anarchist institution with its roots firmly in its community and uh, and branches that reach beyond what any of us nerds in the anarchist book scene have ever thought possible. So I really thank you for that work. And um, I encourage everybody who can to, uh, if you're in the neighborhood of Asheville, North Carolina, visit Firestorm, buy some books, support their mission. They do a lot of good in their community and they have a lot to be proud of. But like all of us, you know, we all need a little help and support from time to time. So, uh, you know, show them some love. Um, Thank you. That's and great. like uh, Liberty and, and Andrew have already uh, mentioned, I, I, I want to also make mention that it's quite likely that many of us are here tonight because um the ongoing genocide in gaza has moved us to rethink our relationship to u.s politics and if you feel that way you are in the right place um you know whether it's israel britain or the united states men and or many other nation states around the world have visited so many horrors upon palestinian people over time um but the current genocide is probably the most horrific of these yet uh so even if uh by the end of the night we're still disagreeing on certain points here, I, I want to remind us all and myself included that, to move forward with uh, with Gaza in our minds and in our hearts. Um, I, so I know that this event is not a book talk, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the reason I was invited here was because a few years ago, I co-edited a little book with my dear friend, uh, Nani Ferreira Matthews, who couldn't be here. Uh, that book was called uh, Why Anarchists Don't Vote. Uh, radical criticisms of representative government. Um, and uh, it's a kind of a small, straightforward collection of some classical anarchist writings on the 
subject of electoralism. Um, we put the book together because we wanted to we wanted a resource to offer people in times such as now to kind of help explain the basic historical anarchist position on elections to people, to readers who are maybe new or unfamiliar with anarchism. Um, and we wanted to we wanted a way to show people in in moments like this, uh, when everything seems so horribly bleak, uh, and when you really can't bring yourself to believe that a literal genocide could ever be considered a lesser evil. Uh, we want, want people to know if you feel that way, you're not alone and, and, and you're not crazy. And in fact, uh, there are people throughout the history of the last 150 or so years who've been very much involved and in some cases have risked their lives in the struggle for human freedom. They've been wrestling with these same questions too for over a century now, um, maybe getting close to two centuries. And uh, so you're in good company uh, and you're in the right place. Uh, most of the essays in this little volume, uh, like I said, are about a hundred or so years old at this point. But when you read them, you really get the sense that like, uh, that they're still really relevant. Um, some of the authors include some famous anarchists you might have heard of, like Emma Goldman, Lucy Parsons, Peter Kropotkin up there looking like Santa Claus. Um, and uh, the also we have uh, a, a lesser studied anarchist figure, uh, Kotoku Shitsui, um, who's actually got probably one of the better pieces in the book. Um, and these were all prominent figures in their country's labor movements or other revolutionary movements. And they're writings at that time at around the turn of the 20th century and some a bit earlier uh kind of point out the important contradictions in the idea of so-called political representation as a sort of major stumbling block on or something like for those freedom movements that they're involved in and uh i mean it seems like we've been we've been stumbling on that same block for about 100 fucking years so <laughs> uh Hopefully, we can get our footing sometime soon. Um, but one of the things that impressed me most when we were putting that book together and, and revisiting all these old writings is that um, a lot of them were written during and even within movements for universal suffrage. So, for example, uh, you have Emma Goldman and Lucy Parsons, who were staunch advocates of voter abstention, just like uh, Andrew just mentioned, uh, even though they themselves were not legally allowed to vote at the time of their writings. Uh, similarly, uh, Kotoko Shisui, uh, he started off uh, his kind of socialist activist career, if you want to call it that, as, as somebody who was a proponent of universal suffrage. And then when he saw the, the potential for the vote to sap the energy of the labor movement, um, he ended up switching his view and made a speech to that effect, uh, which is recorded in the book. Um, and so I find those to be a really powerful demonstration of these people's principles and convictions and, and also a really noteworthy analysis of the roles elections can take in the suppression of freedom movements. Um, but uh, while we were putting that together, like it's a, it's, it's a book on anarchism and it's a, uh, but it's very much informed by uh, a variety of other revolutionary political philosophers and associated histories that Nani and I uh, kind of drew our analysis from. Um, in particular, we were looking at writings on direct democracy by the Afro Trinidadian socialist thinker CLR James, and as well as those by some of our dear comrades, UC Guayana and Dr. Modibo Kadali who were both friends of CLR. Uh, both of those them are still alive today. UC is gonna be a hundred years old in April. Uh, he's got a nearly a century of uh, directly democratic tradition uh, to him. So we're happy he's still here. Um, all three of these guys uh, have been major contributors to anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist and uh, pan-African movements in the 20th century. and. Uh, the fundamental framework for their decades upon decades of organizing has been the idea of direct democracy, uh, defined broadly as 
ordinary people governing themselves without hierarchy and on their own authority. Um, you probably already know, many of you probably already know, the term democracy is derived from the Greek demos kratos, meaning the people govern or the people rule. Um, and when the people in the interpretation of our comrades means ordinary people, means the working class, it means ordinary working class people should be governing themselves, not governed by a representative of theirs who claims to speak for them, but by people themselves. And, and that's an idea that's shared in that direct democratic wing of the Pan-Africanist movement and also with the classical anarchist movement. So it's an interesting overlap there. Um, there are major distinctions to be made between the republic or so-called representative democracy, which is kind of a faux term. It's, not, it's, a, it's a bait and switch kind of term. Um, so distinctions between the republic and, and direct democracy. And uh, in fact, CLR James pointed out that all states are essentially some form of so-called representative government, but that they justify their oppressive authority through different means. This gets back to what Andrew Lee was just saying, um, that the vote is, uh, is a means of legitimating or legitimizing uh, the rule of the, of, of the government, basically of the government or of, of the state itself. Um, anarchists have, like I said, generally agreed with CLR James on this point. And uh, the idea that no state can ever be truly democratic, but that doesn't stop states from using the rhetoric of democracy to justify some of the most violent horrors uh, and brutal oppressions imaginable as we are currently seeing on the news today. Um, and so now in, in the 21st century with the uh, Cold War far behind us, the uh, the means that states use to justify oppression are almost uniformly the vote. There's still some states out there, including at least one really big one. They don't really put too much emphasis on the vote. But generally speaking, as CLR James said, the whole world is in the shadow of state power. Um, and, and, and now he was writing that during the Cold War. Nowadays, that state power is largely uniform and largely um, legitimizes itself through the vote. Um, in this particular election cycle in the United States that we find ourselves in, uh, we've been hearing one phrase over and over and over. They're beating us over the head with it. Our democracy, right? I'm sure we've all heard this one. Uh, we have to save our democracy. This election determines the future of our democracy. This is my least favorite electioneering phrase that I've ever heard in a long line of nonsensical election phrases every couple of years, including Diddy's regrettable vote or die from a decade or so ago. Um, but so I wanna be clear about the context in which we find ourselves tonight. There is no democracy to be found in the United States government, none. The United States is, is the most violent ecologically destructive empire ever to exist on planet earth. I, I think that that's not a controversial claim. Um, it's a government that began, as we all know, as a breakaway, or hope we all know, as a breakaway republic seeking to preserve slavery and violently subjugate indigenous societies and steal their land. That's, that's just the history, right? And since that time, we've seen that breakaway republic metastasize into this runaway cancerous growth of a nation state that's defined itself, really defined itself by constant warfare. And where even at home, right, amongst so-called citizens, we have, to, we have had to organize and fight like hell for any small scrap of social freedom we can get, whether that's the weekend, the eight hour day or suffrage itself um, or an end to uh, an end to uh, Jim Crow segregation. And I mean, hell, the, uh, the the suggestion 
that slavery ought to be abolished literally caused a civil war in this country and hundreds of thousands of people dragged to their deaths, right? This is a bastion of democracy. This is not. Uh, even today, most of our lives, our daily lives, are defined by dictatorship, right? We spend most of our waking hours at work or commuting to work uh, on the job. As you know, the Marxists in the audience will know we have no say in our, our daily lives. We have no say in how we're paid. We have no say in whether or not we'll be able to pay all of our bills, keep our home, turn the water back on. We have no say in our individual or collective destinies in a lot of the ways. We, we have no say in any of it. And yet we're told this is democracy. What part of that situation sounds like democracy? So, for, and for, for the past 150 years, anarchists broadly said, none, that doesn't sound like democracy to us, right? Uh, Marx and Bakunin and, and other thinkers have pointed out that we, the working class, live in a dictatorship run by capitalists and the capitalist's favorite politicians. Um, so engaging in a political arena on those terms is, in the opinion of my, most anarchists, I, I believe, and in my opinion as well, is a losing proposition for any freedom movement. Uh, and so for reasons both moral and practical, anarchists throughout the past century or more have widely advocated voter abstention. As Andrew, as Andrew Lee pointed out, not everybody, right? Some people um, don't advocate voter abstention and call themselves anarchists. And uh, and we can engage and, and uh, have those conversations. Um, but uh, but that's the general perspective that Nani and I brought to uh, this book. Um, and if you want one, you should buy it from Firestorm. Ah, they got them online. Um, anyway, I'm really grateful to be here with you all tonight and um, I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation and uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you. Yeah, great, great framing opening remarks. Um, uh, I wanna encourage anyone who's here in the Zoom with us to feel free to um, put questions in the Q&A and I'm gonna kind of kick us off with a few prompts here that I'm hoping um, uh, y'all can can give thoughts on. Um, so, you know, I think uh, for those of us old enough to remember, uh, in the late 90s and early aughts, the sort of broad consensus on the left uh, was that the two major like political parties in the United States were virtually indistinguishable. Um, this was kind of the, the political context that I came up in. Um, but I think increasingly there's um, this focus on polarization um, in the United States. And uh, you know, the Republican Party has certainly moved very far to the right. I think the, the Democrats have also moved to the right. Um, uh, but I, I guess how different are the political parties now and how does that impact our relationship to elections? Um, Andrew Lee, you you talked about, you know, kind of an acknowledgement that who is in power has some relevancy to our daily lives, right? Like clearly there are policy differences. Um, you know, what is, what's the kind of, where does the rubber hit the road in terms of uh, kind of evaluating these similarities and differences in terms of how we approach elections? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we've, we've certainly seen um, polarization in the two party system in the last decade in the United States. Um, but I, I think that, you know, beyond the rhetoric um, and beyond like significant differences on some issues, like we need, do need to have a realistic view of the powers of the American presidency, um, which in, in, in many ways are rather limited. Um, the options available to any executive are limited by the capacities of the civil service, like the government bureaucracy, federal workers, um, the, the, the court system, um, the, the military, the economic and material conditions. Um, the way that I think about it is like, it's like choosing the CEO of Starbucks, right? The next CEO of Starbucks might be really into different policies or they may be really into like opening new stores or closing existing ones. They could be like, especially anti-union or just like moderately so. 
But if you're really into independent coffee shops, you don't really have any business in that board meeting, right? I think there are real differences between the parties, but I think that the discourse around electoralism, um, particularly from radicals who effectively end up showing for the Democratic Party by doing unpaid get out the vote efforts for them, um, is that like a lot of the very justified outrage and mobilization against Trump evaporated the second Biden got in office, even when he continued or made the exact same policies worse. Um, more migrants have been kicked out of the United States of America by Biden than by Trump. Right. I didn't get that from like a crazy anarchist zine. I got that from politico.com. Right. Um, this is like an objective fact. This is uncontested that Joe Biden expelled forcibly at gunpoint. Right. Because that's how these things go. More people from the United States than Donald Trump did. Where are the protests for the kids in cages? Where did they go? So for folks who are not involved in migrant justice, right? For folks who cared about this until the 2020 election, and then not only stopped going to the protests, they just tuned out of it completely. Um, my contention is you don't care about kids in cages. You don't care about human beings. You didn't want the embarrassment of having a crass, impolite head of state who said the quiet part out loud. That's what you were protesting. But you only cared about the kids in cages until there was a more polished man putting them in them. Um, and if you're upset by that, you can prove me wrong by getting involved by the folks fighting it today, right? But the expulsions of migrants from the, com from the country got worse under Biden than Trump. And I think we saw very quickly all of the people, which is like millions of people across the US, whose interest in supporting migrants, migrant children, little fucking kids locked in warehouses for months, who only cared about that to get someone in office who would kick even more people out? That's not real politic. That's not pragmatism. That's that's like a political and moral catastrophe. That's a horrible way to be in the world. Um, so I, I think that's the perspective from which I come, like how different are the political parties? It's like, yeah, yes, they're different and they're the same. Like, let's look at the actual issues that people mobilize for partisan turnout for elections and then let's actually take them serious i think there's a slander that people who critique the electoral system are like pie in the sky utopians um who you know won't settle for anything less than a perfect society and that's not my position at all i want us to take a very hard-headed objective pragmatic look at what the border patrol of this country is doing and what the weapons manufacturers of this country are doing and what the Pentagon in this country is doing. Um, and because those are the differences that matter, right? Not, not that other differences don't, right? Not that reproductive rights don't matter or um, like the horrifying right-wing attacks on trans people, and especially youth, don't matter. Of course they matter. Of course they are very important. Um, a lot of places were not havens for actual accessible reproductive justice or trans liberation under democratic administrations. If I may remind you of any period in American history up to the present day. Um, but like, yeah, like there's real differences. Um, but if you're trying to turn me out to vote, so there aren't kids in cages. And then 
the kids are still in the cages and there's more kids in the cages and you don't care anymore? I, I don't know what to say to that. I'm... I think people got to look at what their actual commitments are. And if your commitments are to actual flesh and blood human beings who may be at a distance from you in terms of their location or their experience or their position, or if it's about participating in this system and like getting civic engagement brownie points. Andrew Zonneville, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll just briefly, I mean, I 100% agree with every single thing uh, that my esteemed colleague just said. Um, I'll just add one point about the, the differences between the parties um, is that this is my like, I'm a former preschool teacher. This is my preschool teacher version of the lesser evilism thing and how that works. So if you've got a far right party, right? And the logic of lesser evil politics says that the other major oppositional party only needs to be right here, right? And they can say, well, at least we're not the other guy. And so that gives space to the far right party to move over here. They say, oh shit, we got away with that. We can get away with a little bit of this. And then the lesser evil party comes like, oh, okay, we're right here. Uh, well, at least we're not the other guy. And they say, oh shit, we can we can get away with even more. They keep moving to they keep moving to the right. And the the so-called left party, the Democrat is not a left party by any any metric, forget anarchist metrics, any political metric, right? They can keep moving. Both parties keep moving to the right because lesser evil politics essentially uh it it, it allows for the far right to be in control of the uh, of the political conversation. That's how we ended up in the situation today in which uh, Kamala Harris is firmly to the right of George Bush and Ronald Reagan on a number of issues, the most urgent of which is the situation in Palestine and the current genocide that it, that is unfolding there. Um, so lesser evilism, which is really what this question is getting at, the difference of, in parties, is getting at this question of let, isn't one a lesser evil? That whole framework, that whole strategy is completely failed. It's allowed the mainstream political conversation in the United States to move way further to the right than it was, uh, you know, even 10 years ago, forget 20, 30 years ago. It's it's a lot worse. Um so it's really been a disaster. And uh uh I mean, really, no matter what proponents of that lesser evil kind of politics say they never manage to figure out exactly how to hold the politicians feet to the fire how that's going to happen is never explained um or whatever slogan is going to be in a given year and it never ends up working out so we have to understand that the differences between the parties are in in my view close to razor thin and um and they and what's really happened is we have a, a far right, a generalized far right political movement in uh, a country that uh, lesser evilism is is very much a part of uh, of how that's unfolded. Yeah, if I could just add to that, like imagine, okay, think back to any genocide in world history, right? Like pick pick a genocide. Now imagine that the party leader who was conducting that genocide had like an internal party vote and someone was like running against him from the same party who said, I want to do the genocide faster. Would you do get out the vote efforts for the first guy? Really? Like, like if, if it was like 1937 in Germany and like, Goebbels was contesting Hitler for a leadership of the Nazi party and was like, I want to do the, the Holocaust faster. Would you have done get out the vote for Adolf Hitler? Right? Because like, that's kind of the situation we're in. 
right? Like there's a guy doing the genocide and a bunch of folks are like, yeah, you know, we're good left liberals. We don't like that. But the other guy would do it faster. So we go, you know, what do you do? You got to go vote. Um, yeah, my contention is if, if you would do that sort of in, in any genocide, um, you're an irredeemable ghoul. Like that's not the move. That's never the move. Um, we would not look kindly on the people who did that, who would, if someone had done that in the 30s. And um, I pray that our descendants do not look kindly on those who make that choice today. Um, that's just, no, absolutely not. Again, at some point in time, you have to say the system that's doing these things, right? The system that murdered tens of thousands of refugees and fucking tents is our enemy. That no matter who is in office and continues, because whoever is in that office will continue it to the best of their ability until we stop them, is our enemy. Um, there, 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 there's a quote I have from, from George Jackson from, from Blood in My Eye that I think is relevant. Um, he says participation in electoral politics organized by the enemy state after recognizing that the whole process must be discredited as a conditional step into revolution and particularly particip participation that tends to authenticate this process is the opposite of revolution. It's a tactic for the ultra rightists with history as a guide. We could never make such monumental errors. To repeat, participation in electoral politics organized by the enemy state is the opposite of revolution. With history as a guide, we could never make such monumental errors. There's a state that is committing genocide right now. If you're watching this, you probably live within its borders. And you got to make a choice. Is it an enemy state? Or can we go along to get along? Can we try to do the right thing? Can we try to push it away? Um, clean it up around the edges. Y'all y'all have really, uh, I think, made a great case here. There's a lot of other um, topics to cover. Uh, and I can already tell that we're not going to get to all of them, which pains me. Um, we're getting some great questions in the chat, particularly about kind of some of the nuances of like national versus local electoral politics. Um, I also want to make sure that, um, you know, we, we talk about what the kind of what the alternatives are. Um, and, and I think there's some more interesting historic context to explore as well. So I'm going to do my best to get us through some of that with our time that's left here. Um, this has been great so far. Um, so for a lot of uh, US Americans, democracy means casting a ballot every few years. Um, and for a much smaller number of people, um, maybe it also means uh, donating money to a political cause or petitioning elected representatives um, or otherwise doing some type of like civic engagement. Um, can you all reflect for us on um, how the idea of doing democracy in this way contrasts with anarchist ideas of you know, we already heard kind of direct democracy uh, thrown out there as as a concept um, or direct action or self-organization. Um, yeah, I mean, just briefly. So I, I think, is this. Is this the question? This seems like the question of, okay, so we heard you're not voting, but what do we do? Is that is that where this is getting at? Well, um, I think there's like a, a a philosophical thing of like what what does what does engagement look like? You know, if if democracy is the sort of watchword of kind of our current political system, you know what what does anarchism offer as an alternative? And then also, I do think the question of like, what do we do instead is is one that often people, you know, want to raise. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times when people are, are raising that question, 
sometimes they're looking for an organization to join or they're, they're like more middle class folks who are looking for some place to contribute some money. Um, my advice is always, you know, let's stop looking for someone else's project to join and start asking ourselves what we can contribute to in the world around us and, and to build the world that we want to see. Um, I'm endlessly encouraged by even the smallest acts of, of people building community uh, where they, you know, where they live, um, you know, starting a, a meetup or a study group to talk about issues in your community can be a profoundly radical undertaking. It costs no money um and uh only yields uh better relationships with your neighbors more understanding of uh issues uh facing people who you know from your daily life um and it can be you know a really radical thing uh so i think i think you know people should open themselves up to meeting new people and asking critical questions um uh, about the world as it's presented to them opportunities for collaboration you know and direct action they'll they'll find you um i, I guarantee it I, i've met actually some of my uh, closest comrades at events like this one uh in fact i just got back from nova scotia where i did a book talk for my other book uh on georgia history um i know it's weird right? i did a georgia history book talk in canada but it, it happened and, and the reason it happened is because uh, uh of some folks i met on a firestorm call or a firestorm event actually uh some years ago about four years ago um so you know the people in the projects they have a way of finding you um if you're if 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 you're thinking critically and you're and you're and you're thinking outside the box a little bit on what you're open to doing um i guess that's a good as good a, well the other thing i'll say is that if you're looking for Okay, this all sounds good, but but where does this happen? Where does this work? Um, Cindy Milstein edited a wonderful collection of essays called "Deciding for Ourselves: The Pro the, the Promise of Direct Democracy." It's called "Deciding for Ourselves," and in that book, Cindy collects a number of essays from people all over the world currently engaged in community level directly democratic politics. Some of it quite radical, some of it quite, you know, re really facing facing down the state in a lot of examples. Uh, it's examples from uh, from Mexico to Scandinavia to uh, the uh, Middle East. Um, so I really encourage people to, to check that check out that book and, and at least familiarize yourself with those histories because the stuff happens all the time. That's a fantastic volume to recommend. Um, Andrew Lee, is there anything you'd like to kind of add to this question of um, uh, kind of um, kind of the, the anarchist vision of uh, direct democracy or direct action, self-organization? I'm not particularly into like fetishization of like democratic or directly democratic procedures. Um, I think it can also turn into like a weird ritual. Um, but I think, you know, anyone who's been part of, like, an underground music scene or, uh, like, a crew of friends or, like, any number of, like, social engagements know that, like, people can have the capacity to do, like, really cool shit with the right, like, infrastructure, basically, right? Like, if we have ways of relating to one another that like facilitate us doing like cool shit that we're into, people are gonna do cool shit that they're into. Um, a lot of the coolest projects that I've seen, no one got paid for, um, no one got permission to do them. Um, they had no institutional authority. Um, but we can have systems that like facilitate stuff like that happening. And we can have systems that facilitate us acting in disengaged or just brutal ways with one another. Right. Um, I don't think 
you have to think that everyone's like inherently good or virtuous to be an anarchist. I think people do messed up stuff all the time. I think that there are systems that incentivize messed up stuff. Um, and one of them is the capitalist state. Um, it's kind of its whole like reason for being. Um, it's like, yeah, the 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 world's greatest machine for like producing self-interested messed up stuff um on a world historic scale. Um I also think like I I just want to respond if it's okay to the folks talking about like uh you know local elections or like um state or or ballot initiatives. Um like yeah, yeah I think... maybe I can just paraphrase one of those questions um uh just because I you know I, we do have several people asking about that. Um Jim says, you know, uh you know, these are compelling arguments about not voting for president. I can see how it's possible in most jurisdictions to extend this to not voting for Congress, but it seems less compelling and less pragmatic to withhold voting altogether as an anarchist principle. What about not voting for dog catcher? Does that matter? Or city alderman, where you might actually find someone who's aligned with your radical values? Sure. Um, I know people have different opinions on this, and I think that's fine. Um, I guess my perspective is like, who makes the dog catcher the dog catcher, right? Like who, who gives authority to the dog catcher? It's like, like the American government, right? Like um, it might be the dog catcher of Middleborough, wherever, but like that government only gets its authority from being part of the state that it's in. And that only gets its authority from being under the sovereignty of the US federal government. Right, so I think it's all kind of the same thing, right? They aren't going to get the nuclear launch codes, but like it's it, it's the American government, right? The state government is integrated, it is the American government. Your county commissioner is the American government. Um, these are all agents of, again, what, what George Jackson encourages us to remember is an enemy state. Um, does that mean that everyone who is a functionary in that state has the same capacity for violence or harm or is, you know, morally equivalent? No, of course not. Of course not. But in terms of the legitimation of the U.S. government, these aren't separate parts. It, it's the same thing, right? You could say, I choose not to vote for a president. I do choose to vote for county commissioner. But you're still saying that the ballot is the mechanism by which someone legitimately gains their title in this state system. Um, the other thing is, like, I mean, as we've seen, people have strong reactions to uh, being told that someone doesn't vote. I I I I want to I want to step the back a little bit. Like most people don't vote. We had record turnout in 2020. Generally, most people don't vote. Certainly not in midterms. Certainly not in local races. Um, people don't have enough information to make informed decisions. And people don't have time. And people don't think it matters, which I agree with. A lot of people don't vote. The people who are, who get upset about voting are not most people. It's people with political commitments, with ideological commitments. And we know statistically that people are more likely to vote in the United States if they have more money and if they have higher degrees of education and unfortunately, these are the demographics that are overrepresented in some radical spaces. Those are the people who have big feelings about not voting, right? It, it is not the case that most Americans feel very strongly that you have to vote in every election. Um, the people who are more inclined to vote are disproportionately wealthy, disproportionately educated, um, and disproportionately white. 
um, take that as you will. But I, I do think that it can be useful to not vote in any, ele any elections because then you get to have conversations like this with people about why you don't. Um, and I think you get to have a conversation about what decision making and power and community control might actually look like. Um, and I think like like th there's a, um, a a question about like you know the the complete abortion ban that folks are facing in North Carolina, um, which would obviously be be hard line. I think the thing to remember is that anything that the state gives, the state can take away, right? You can beat it off for four years, and that would uh, literally save people's lives. But that doesn't mean it won't the ban won't be back and succeed in the next election. Um, but there are people doing really inspiring autonomous healthcare work that can support people who are pregnant regardless of the law, regardless of what the regime says, um, and building those autonomous capacities in our social movements to take care of folks in real ways um, is going to be way more effective um, and yeah, and, and life-saving than, than casting a single ballot would be. Andrew Zonneveld, anything you want to jump in with on that? Um, we can also grab another question here. I see there's one about France, which I know you might be yeah, interested uh, in. Might be. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, great. Yeah. So this is sort of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I think oftentimes people, and in fact, in, on Instagram, people kind of immediately brought up, you know, this question of um, who can and can't vote, whether or not voting is actually mandatory. Um, and we know that, you know, a lot of blood has been spilled um, in North America uh, over who gets to vote. Um, and at the founding of the country, as we already talked about, voting was restricted only to property owning white men. Um, since then, obviously, uh, you know, the, the franchise has expanded and dramatically, but even still, we have you know seventy three million young people, um, forty five million non citizens, and four million uh, folks who have felony convictions who are barred from voting. So that's a lot of people who the state is seemingly very invested in not having vote. Um, and on the other hand, history shows that sometimes enfranchisement seems to support the agenda of the state in some ways. Um, and you know we've got a question uh, in the Q and A about what's going on in France. And I, I think that what that individual is getting at um, is in regards to uh, France's attempt to expand voting for settlers in New Caledonia, um, which you know, recently sparked a massive uprising and anti-colonial independence movement um, from indigenous people. Um, so th there's something here about when the state uh, seems to be very invested in allowing people to vote or when the state seems to be invested in expanding uh, people's, you know, some perhaps some people's uh, right to vote. Um, could you could you speak to that and perhaps this question of the relationship between voting and and, uh, and colonialism? Yeah, well, I think that also maybe what the 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 participant question might be also getting at is this idea that in in France uh people you know essentially voted one way and the uh the president Macron has essentially said well no we're not going to do that um which unfortunately according to their constitution he has every legal right to do um Tariq Ali was on democracy now this morning and he pointed out like this is another reason why the, because in France, this is their fifth version of the Republic, right? Um, so is it the, the fifth Republic needs to go away and need to redraw their constitution and blah, 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 uh, which of course he's right about. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's a great example of how like, you know, the state is going to, the state is going to do what the state wants to do. And if you want to do something the state doesn't want you to do, you got to be prepared to fight back on some other grounds besides, 
j just voting harder, right? Um, now, to your question about New Caledonia or Kanaki, as it's, uh, as I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, but uh, Kanaki, as it's uh, referred to in its indigenous language, um, this is one of the few remaining French settler colonies in the South Pacific. Um, it's the home of the Kanak people. Um, the Kanak people's traditional systems of self-governance governance, extending back thousands of years uh, did not rely on electoralism or the individual vote, uh, but rather on a popular, directly democratic, consensus-based decision-making facilitated by or, or mediated by uh, trusted elders. Uh, in a colonialist period, this was often misunderstood as so-called chieftainship, right? And now historians and, and anthropologists are kind of challenging those old designations um, as being, you know, quite wooden and out of touch. Um, but, uh, you know, according to a recent article I wrote, a more accurate way to describe, or not, not an article I wrote, sorry, article I read, I did not write an article on this and I'm not an expert. I'm just reporting what I read. Um, is that uh, Melanesian societies like Kanaki were more horizontally self-governed with no bureaucracy and were based on what the author of the article called, uh, I have it written here, uh, segmentary family relationships organized without a hierarchy. Um, indeed, there was actually an anecdote in that same piece uh, that Almost every person interviewed by early in in New Caledonia by early French colonists claimed to be a chief of some kind or another, which confused the hell out of the French at the time, and uh, uh, and and they saw the they understood the leadership as a role of a single commanding individual and not a collective responsibility. So it's fundamentally different perspective on uh, um, what leadership is or what. Uh, uh, what governance is, right? So process continues to unfold and hierarchy, just like in every or most col uh, colonial situations kind of imposed on the society uh, uh, by the French political system, including its courts, its militaries and military and police and so forth. Um, and that's the, re the Repub some uh, subordinate version of the Republican model of governance is kind of imposed there, right? Um, and uh, it's imposed undemocratically, right? They had no say in this. Like, now you have the vote. This is how you do politics, deal with it. And some people, I mean, they do recognize it as their only legal mechanism by which they can influence the laws that govern their country. What decides who, how how it gets decided who can do what and who goes to jail. You know, it's, it's a... It, 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 there's a, some serious uh, repercussions with those decisions, so people are somewhat forced to participate. Um, but in resistance to this, the Kanak people have maintained a dynamic and militant independence movement for 150 years, right? It's it's never really gone away. This thing erupts all the time. Um, and But even so, increasing number of French settlers have moved there and and other people immigrating from the region to the point that now the Kanak people are a demographic minority in their homeland. Um, the reason why that's important is jumping to the present day, what just happened in New Caledonia, is that the French legislature voted to expand the voting rights of French settlers in New Caledonia. But under the old rules, Nobody had moved who moved there after 1998, I think it was, uh, was eligible to vote, um, which was like the majority of the uh, like the white French population. And the new rules are if you've been there for 10 years or more, uh, you can now vote in local elections there. So, the uh, in this way, the expansion of the, uh, the franchise, right? The expansion of voting rights is being used to kind of uh, deepen and uh, and exacerbate uh, colonialism. Um, the Kanai people clearly were very upset with this. And if anybody saw any of the news coming out of, the, of, of that region uh, in the spring, you saw that there was a huge general strike and protest movement that broke out 
in uh, the capital city of Noumea um, in opposition to these policy changes. The uh, police were attacking protesters, which, you know, of course, in turn sparked an even more militant rebellion. Barricades going up, shops are getting looted, police cars are on fire. A whole ass factory got burned to the ground. Um, there, there were tons of clashes between the police and uh, the independence movement. People got killed. Um, and and this, uh, at one point, the authorities imposed a curfew uh, in France. France sent from, this is to the other side of the world, mind you, France sent gendarmes from France to New Caledonia to suppress the revolt. Um, and it was a straight up old school colonialist move, right? All to support the expansion of the vote for white settlers. Um, and the whole, and in, in what ended up happening, a, a bunch of the prominent uh, independence party leaders have essentially been kidnapped and by the military and taken to France and put in prison. Um, and but but literally as we speak, this struggle is still happening. Right, this popped off in May. It's still going on. It's very very hot right now. Um, we don't know what's going to happen, but the core of the issue that the core issue that sparked this is has been this attempt by a colonial power to use the vote and the rhetoric of universal suffrage to actually disenfranchise indigenous people, as they would say, dilute their vote, right? Um, and, and it's an instructive example of how the state can use the vote to justify its most repressive politics. Exact same thing happened, by the way, in the 1830s in the United States of America. We mentioned earlier that at one point only property owning white people could vote, white men could vote. So when did it happen that white men who did not own property could vote, right? That happened in the 1830s under something called Jacksonian democracy, right? It, it happened because Andrew Jackson and the, well, really the state, the US state at large needed more so-called citizens to go west and steal land. Um, they needed to enfranchise more people with citizenship rights. That's why that expansion of voting rights happened. It, I mean, it's it's well documented. Um, so the state policing who can and can't vote, it's always based on what's in the interests of the state. Um, if the state, to preserve itself, feels it needs to expand the vote, whether in response to a social movement or in response to just its own conniving interests, it will do that. If to preserve itself, it wants to restrict somebody else's vote, it will do that too. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of other examples. Uh, that another great one uh, is uh, Barbuda right now um, in the Caribbean. Uh, some, some folks might be familiar with the country of Antigua and Barbuda. Barbuda is a smaller island where traditionally people have held all the land and the fisheries in common. Um, they are a minority in their parliament. They have no chance of ever having a majority. So they're basically governed uh, dictatorially by whoever is in office in Antigua. And they have, you know, no chance of ever getting any kind of like you know, mainstream kind of lobby, lobbying type situation to really push for their interest to like keep holding all the land in common and all the fisheries in common because that doesn't make anybody any money uh, except for the people who live there. It's like they live there, they live this way, but they can't, there's nobody within that electoral system is going to defend them, right? And so they're very clear on that. If you, if you listen to some of the um, stuff that's coming out uh, from Barbuda right now. Uh, they're very clear. I forget what the names of the two parties are, but the two major parties. Uh, but they're very clear that neither of these two major parties are doing anything for them, including the one that has in the past supported them. Um, so, and yeah, and, and the result is they're having to fight like hell just to keep what they've had since emancipation. Um, it's it, it's it's really rough, but the, the logic of representation is at play behind all of this.
Andrew Lee, any any thoughts on this question of um, kind of uh, the state's uh, seeming interest in both restricting and also expanding at other times um, uh, access to the ballot? Yeah, um, I think Andrew identified correctly that we lose so much thinking just about the, the franchise or the vote in general. Like we have to think about the actual conditions at play in a situation. For New Caledonia, it's the vote in relation to settlerism. Um, and I think in terms of seeing you know, continued attacks on voting rights post Jim Crow is emblematic in the US of the transition from domestic colonialism to neocolonialism, right? We've moved from um, strictly racial exclusion um, in through the 1950s and 60s from the franchise, at least in the South, um, to a neo-colonial situation where we have petty bourgeoisies of um, Black and Latine and Asian communities um, accepted, integrated into the, the power structure in the United States, um, even as there is a continued war of elimination, of incarceration, and of deportation against those who are denied uh, political power token representation, and correspondingly, um, attacks on their, their ability to vote, right? Um, the ballot box is a way to tie the interests of segments of the population to give them a perceived interest in the health and survival and actions of the state, right? Originally, it was white male property owners. Then, as Andrew said, during Jacksonian democracy, it was the white genocidaires who were being sent um, to ethnic clans, the Western United States. Um, for them to think this government is me and I am it, and we are on the same team. And, and the people who the US regime have admitted onto its team at least nominally, has changed in the last uh, 50 years, right? Um, and there were real struggles that forced that change. But we also see that there are many cities around the country that have had Democratic Party leadership of color for generations. For generations. And where are the benefits for poor and working class urban communities in those cities? What has it gotten them, right? These are the communities whose revolt in the late 60s um, provided the impetus for these modest voting reforms to even get passed. Um, so where's the proof, right? Like now you've had it, you've ruled for decades um, why is there still poverty? Why is there still disenfranchisement, right? Why is there still dilapidated schools and unfit housing? Um, why, why, why does any of this still exist? Because th these were all instrumental goals. Like expanding the franchise was an instrumental goal. Diversifying what were formerly all white city councils and mayor's offices and police departments with an instrumental goal to get things for the masses of people. Um, where are those things now? Um, I think, you know, some, something I, I think a lot about, um, you know, especially with my, my book on gentrification, Defying Displacement, is like communities in the 60s were demanding positive like additions to their community like we want our community and we want dignified housing right and we want community controlled education and we want community controlled public safety and we want ethnic studies right and we want the sidewalks fixed it, today in cities around the country communities of color these same communities are fighting desperately to stop from being gentrified and are facing off the entirety of their local political and civic and economic elites 
I want us to think about what the demand to not be gentrified is. It's the most modest reform you can imagine. It's not even a reform. It's saying, can we keep things the way that they are? Can I keep paying too much rent to my absentee landlord so my kids can go to a um, underfunded school and I can work my dead end job? Can we? Can I please just keep everything the same? Just don't raise my rent to three times what I can afford. And still, these folks are opposed by the entirety of their local political establishments united to de to deny them that single exceedingly reasonable demand. That's what we've gotten with 50 years of democratic representation. That's how much we've lost. I also just want to shout out the person in the chat who typed, this is a deeply unserious conversation, which is like, fine. Look, it's not for everyone. It's not, that's fine. That's fine. It's, it's a fringe opinion. I get it. It's just funny because Russ White typed this an hour and six minutes into this deeply unserious conversation. And it's like, friend, you got to get better at detecting unserious conversations earlier because you lost like an hour of your night. <laughs> It, it looks like that was just directed at us. I don't know if anybody else could see it, but uh, but maybe they can. It just says two hosts and panelists. Well, y'all, I I deeply appreciate this deeply unserious conversation. Um, it's been mm -hmm. incredibly provocative. Um, y'all have raised so many in incredible points, some of which are familiar, and I'm sure some of which are, are very new for folks uh, to chew on and consider. Um, we are uh, kind of at the end of our time tonight. I feel like this is a big conversation. It's a conversation with, uh, you know, a lot, a lot more to explore. And I hope it's a conversation that people are having in their own communities and with people in their lives. Um, because, you know, as, as was mentioned uh, at the beginning of this uh, event, regardless of what people um, end up doing in November, um, there's an enormous amount uh, that is still going to be on our plates as we go into 2025. And unfortunately, the situation in Gaza is one of those things. Um, so thank you to everybody who came out tonight. Thank you so much um, uh, to both Andrews. Um, I really appreciate y'all agreeing to do this conversation and, and for bringing so much thoughtful content for us to consider. Thank you, Liberty. It's awesome. Thank you, Firestorm. Thank and thank you, you to everybody who enjoyed. came and joined in on the chat or submitted questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to absolutely everything, um, but I, I hope it was worth your time. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs>